And we are live. I'm joined by Luke Marson and Jarrett Pazahonic. Luke and Jarrett, how's it going? Hey, John. Hey, Thanks for having hey. us. Welcome to the Americans uh, Series Review Podcast. <laughs> Jarrett, if only we could spend the whole time just going over the Americans, it'd be great. But unfortunately, our listeners are counting us for something else. So Maybe another podcast, another uh, topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a really great season, though. I thought the finale was not quite... Perfect, but the season as a whole, highly recommended. Me as well. <laughs> and with that, we move on <laughs> to the topic of the day, which is S4 HANA, HCM, and U. <laughs> and this actually came out from uh, the ASUG annual conference, Sapphire Extravaganza in Orlando. Luke, you and I attempted to do a podcast, but we just couldn't get it together. Uh, so here we are. And, and Jared, it was, it was almost like you were there, man. I mean, I have to say that uh, SAP does an unbelievable job, better than any vendor, enterprise software vendor, on making people that want to watch from abroad uh, be able to see the keynotes and be able to see all the key, all the key events. So it's really, it's really excellent. I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. And I read something that there was, you know, you don't know if the numbers are accurate or not, but they were saying hundreds of thousands of people were watching various points uh, abroad. So it almost felt like you were there. And in some cases, it was actually a little. E it's a little easier to follow from abroad than being there in person. Right. And what about you, Luke? I thought it was great being there, but like Jared, actually, on one or two times, I did take advantage of their streaming, and you know, I think I watched a keynote from my hotel room. A tip I learned from uh, your good friend Dennis Howlett. You know, save save some uh, effort and trying to find a seat and get a good spot when you can just watch it all in high def from uh, somewhere else. So, I I did take advantage of that and I watched a couple of the replays as well and stuff. And I thought it was uh, I thought it was excellent. The quality and and the way it was covered was really really good. Yeah, I was actually um, I won't say which keynote, but I was uh, taking a shower during one of the keynotes with the speakers all blasted up and the sound was perfect and I got myself all ready to go. It was it was great. Um, so, kudos to SAP because I definitely look better all cleaned up than I would have otherwise. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, we're actually going to talk about two sort of different topics here. We're going to talk about uh, S4 HANA and HCM, and then we're going to reboot and talk a bit about project work in the field and what these guys are seeing on uh, Success Factors projects and some lessons on on cloud projects as well. Um, so I want to start with the S4 HANA piece. My impression, okay, so SAP. In, in a broader sense, is still clarifying roadmap and direction with S4 HANA to satisfy customers. Uh, we did interview a bunch of S4 HANA customers at, at Sapphire and started to get a clearer sense of, of where that stands. But I'm also getting the impression that, that from the HCM side and how HCM fits into the picture, this is a real big question for customers. And I think SAP's made some progress there, but I'm really curious to get uh, your responses to that, and just anything else that you saw from an HCM perspective and how it ties in. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, but before I go much further, I also want to just say that uh, for deeper dives, you should definitely catch these guys on the on the SAP HCM Insights podcast series with Steve Bogner and the gang. It's it's probably the best podcast series in the enterprise that I know of. So um, with that in mind, Luke, what did you see on the ground? What were your perceptions? I thought there was a lot of positivity. I really enjoyed the vibe. I mean, it was very busy. There's a lot of people there. Uh, there were a lot of messages in the keynotes. SAP seemed to string together all of their kind of cloud components. There was mentions of success factors, of field glass, Ariba, Concur, etc., as well as an S4 HANA. So uh, I thought it was I thought I thought it was good that they were covering all of those and giving visibility to all the different um, products that they have, and they have a lot because, of course, they have a very diverse portfolio, and they continue to expand this, the type of customers that they they're wanting to offer services for. So it, it was really good being there and 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 starting to hear customer stories from Success Factors, from S4 HANA, uh, just meeting all these different types of customers who are, who are, who are actually using the software actually getting value from it now you know it, it's no longer just theory this whole uh, s4 hana thing and sap hana and and even hana cloud platform is starting to have some customers that are telling their stories there still needs to be more of that from the from the hr space which i didn't see much of 
Um, but I'm hoping in the next year or so, we're going to see much more on, on um, success factors extensions on HANA Cloud Platform. But generally, I, I thought it was it was it was really good and coherent how S3 was, was starting to position things. You know, they're starting to get their story together and get their messaging together, and it's like they are now beginning to mature in terms of the next phase of SAP, which is this you know the whole cloud-based um, uh, ERP and and whatnot. So I, I I thought it was good from that perspective compared to having been there for the last four years or so. Yeah, I mean, one thing for me is I, when I hear Orlando, I can't help think of the horrible events that happened over this past weekend. So first of all, my, my thoughts go out to everyone impacted by that. And um, but uh, on the topic, on the topic uh, that we're talking about here, I mean, a few things jump out at me. One of them is, you know, the thought is we heard 3,200 customers on S4HANA, and, and one of the biggest things bought S4HANA. So that's one of the key things, and some of the numbers. You know, I've seen some ASOG reporting, and, and they we're starting to get sort of the behind the scenes is there's only 800 active projects. And, and then you start to go back down, and I can't remember the number that was live, but maybe it was 100 live. And so you're starting to see that was a lot of the messaging is I think SAP did a pretty good job of going out and selling S4HANA. Um, you know, when you start to see the 2400 somewhat shelfware or something makes you sort of question a little bit about that. but. Um, you started to see that they're having a hard time getting it deployed and uh, or, or having customers that are actually doing implementations and those ones, the quarter that are, you know, a subset of those are live. So it tells you that there's a reason why SAP started talking about professional services and, and accelerators and various tools and, and, you know, holding SIs accountable. And those are some of the things we're seeing in the success factors world as well is that the software is being sold, but getting it to being live customers is is uh, taking is some challenges that um, that I think SAP is looking to address. And the other one of the biggest things that really actually shocked me, and I'm not that shocked anymore in the SAP world, but for whatever reason, I was thinking that half the customers were public cloud, half the customers were private cloud. That was just my own sort of never saw any numbers, but to find out that only 12 of the 3,200 customers, again, 12 of the 3,200 customers are public cloud, I found that very shocking. And, uh, you know, in the world that Luke and I work in, you know, success factors, well, I worked in both worlds, but and I still do, but in the success factors world, you know, it is, it is multi-tenant public cloud. And so I, I don't know about your guys' thoughts, but I just thought that there was more customers going in that direction. And, Longer term, uh, I think that SAP is going to have some challenges if 95% of their customers are, are choosing the uh, a private cloud version um, just due to costs and updates and, and a lot of other pieces. And so curious to get your guys' take on that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think uh, just a couple points there. One is the number I heard was around 150 live customers. That's not too far off from what you're – you got there. These numbers, uh, your mileage will vary based on how these are counted. Uh, and 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 to your point, uh, you know, I think with S4 HANA in general, when you looked at those live customers, and we we interviewed more than ten live customers on video, and then a few more that weren't on video. Uh, most of those customers were probably not what you would call the classic SAP customer that SAP surely wants to move to S4 HANA, which are you know, a customer with a complex legacy environment that is looking to make the move maybe all the way to S4 HANA. Maybe they went to Business Suite on HANA first. Um, there are not that many stories that, that I have found personally of that type of customer, uh, which is sort of understandable because that's that's a fairly big project. Uh, there was one really interesting one that does fit that description that we did on video with Asian paints. It was very interesting to hear their story. A lot of the ones that we picked up on were different variations on a theme, in some cases greenfield implementations and such. So so, so I guess that's the first seed I wanted to plant is that there's different kinds of S4HANA customers. And as in terms of your cloud question, I think SAP is pretty concerned about that as well because even though SAP has been a real pain in the ass to nail down in terms of like you know, what a cloud actually means from a public versus private cloud standpoint in the past. I think they do realize the economies of scale on public cloud and what that can mean to customers. But my personal take on it, Jared, is that 
I don't think the functionality is quite there yet on the public cloud version uh, for enough customers to really consider that from a classic SAP customer standpoint. And I think that's starting to change a little bit, as you said, with like professional services and such. Um, and so I talked to a couple of smaller companies at the conference that were seriously considering the public cloud version. But I, I do think they're going to have to flesh out the functionality further before we can really get a true test of that. Yeah, I mean, just, just one thing that jumped out to me, and I hadn't realized it, but Mike Etling, who runs the Success Factors and SAP HCM business at SAP, also runs the S4 HANA public cloud. So, I mean, to me, he, he totally gets the, the benefits of, of multi-tenant cloud uh, offerings, as well as, uh, you know, he's been very open and transparent in the uh, Success Factors and SAP side of things. And, you know, the fact that SAP released that they only had 12 public cloud customers, you know, that, 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 that's, uh, I think that's a good thing because we know where they're at right now and there's no, you know, smoke and mirrors about that. But, but I just get the, you know, the question is if I'm a customer and I'm looking for references, you know, how many references is there going to be any time in the next two, two, three years for the public cloud? And the challenge would be is customers like to follow, uh, you know, what they've seen successful at other places. And, and to me, that's going to be heavily skewed towards, the private cloud and so down the road you know is SAP like you said going to be able to monetize and do the things they need to do to continue to support the development and the other things um, and meet, make Wall Street happy if if their deployment model is more of what I call sort of a old school deployment model. Well just one thing I want to add there too Jared is that I think there are, this goes back to the podcast that you guys did on which you called good practices which was really cool and and it goes back to some discussions you guys were having on, you know, customers needing to get used to this understanding that you're not going to be able to bring all your customizations with you and that you're going to have to look sometimes at standard processes to make things work. And while the cloud provides some configuration, you have to understand that it's not the same as, you know, the luxury you had in the past, luxury or curse, however you want to think about it, <laughs> of customizing the hell out of your software with, with code. And, so when you think about the cloud, think about it like this in the sense that you could have a private cloud on S4HANA where you begin the process of standardizing your processes and moving to a, a more sort of compliant landscape with eventual move to a public cloud, or you could do as some SAP customers are doing and, and stick with a HANA enterprise cloud where you can really, that's really keeping all your customizations. In fact, SAP doesn't even consider that cloud when they market it. But essentially, it's it's a hosted environment, right, where you get to keep all your stuff, <laughs> and and that if I think to your point, Jared, if customers stick with that, then you wonder how these transitions would ever happen. On the other hand, if they do make a move to a private cloud and start cleaning up their environments and start standardizing on certain processes, I think that does eventually facilitate a move to a public cloud later. Yeah, I mean, I'll let Luke chime in. Uh, just a one point on that is that's really not how, unfortunately, that's not how customers think. Uh, customers do a major right. implementation. They'll go to S4HANA. They'll do it on the pri you know, private cloud, and they'll clean up some things there, maybe that they have to or, or that they feel like they want to. There's right. no business case for them to go to the public cloud after that. So unfortunately, I mean, in a perfect world, you could say all these years customers could have cleaned up their SAP HCM environment and then moved right. to success factors. But in, at the end of the day, it turned out just to stay and and where they're at and not do anything, or I would call it rip off the band aid and move over. And to me, right now, we don't have enough customers ripping off the band aid. I did see SAP come out with some tools that will show you how many customizations you had in your system, which I thought was a was was I would have I thought it would already be there, but the fact that it is there, I guess now is good. But the issue is, is each one of those customizations that you built works for your business now, and to sort of unravel all the ties that this customization has to figure out if you can really rip it and then there's enough functionality to replace it in some of your core areas that that's just a huge undertaking i mean to me it that that could take weeks and months depending on how ingrained some custom functionality you have built in and you can't underestimate the time and the risk and the complexity that that takes and and so yep it's it'll just it be interesting to see what do you think luke well, I'd be quite interested to know how many of those S4HANA customers have anything on the cloud. 
Because I think moving to the cloud is a big leap for a lot of customers, at least in their minds it is. I don't think it's, a, it's as big as a leap as maybe they think it is. But for someone that maybe wants to get more HANA but has never even touched the cloud, maybe they don't, they don't have their HR on the cloud or they, you know, they're not using a Concur or something like that. Then for that, the first step into the cloud to be S4 HANA, it, it, it's going to take a real leap of faith for any customer to want to, to do that. And and so that's why I would personally be interested to see how many of those customers had any 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 cloud and and maybe SAP need to look at those customers who want to go for Hanum and maybe try and get them onto onto the cloud in another way maybe get them, move them slowly their HR first maybe then um, you know uh, their procurement or their uh, travel expenses sourcing whatever onto the cloud first. And so slowly get them to transition that mindset to the point where they realize that actually we, we can move to the cloud and we can start moving these larger ERP processes onto the cloud. But Jared's absolutely right that it, 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 even, even on something, just one area like HR, it can be a huge undertaking to work out what customizations you have, you know, try and simplify some of that complexity. And many organizations don't do that up front. They kind of get into the project and kind of expect to do it and then realize there's a whole bunch of process rework and, and, and they have to involve this team over here and this team and this team and do all of this and when you've got a fixed uh, already defined project plan to implement the software it's really hard to then rework all that and, and do all that because you realize you've got all this process work to do and often I think customers will just try and do the best they can and often just pull over their complexity or, or, or that specific process into the cloud and you imagine that in HR, you've got maybe three, four, five areas, but in an ERP project, you could have 10, 20, 30 of those areas. And, and that, that becomes really difficult then for customers to be able to, to lift and shift all of that. Even though they, you know, you say hey, you shouldn't be lifting and shifting, it should be redesigned. The, 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 I think the sad reality from what I see in here from time to time is for a lot of customers, they have no choice in some areas but to lift and shift what they've got and move it from on-premise into the cloud. Yeah, and John, I have a question maybe back for you, and maybe you heard in some of your discussions is, how, why was the private cloud, why does that have all this functionality that the public cloud doesn't? And like, are these all different lines of code that SAP is maintaining? Because when we had those initial, comp when we had those initial like, uh, release of S4 HANA, it, it, it sounded like it was all public cloud at that point in time. And then it feels like over time that shifted to, multiple different versions of the software and I'm just it, it just seems uh, unique to me because I thought some of it was going to be a rewrite so why is one faster than the other as far as coming out with functionality and I wonder whether whether SAP intended to be public cloud and they couldn't just get the uptake from the customers and they've then backported it onto private cloud onto on-premise and just tried to basically do what customers want because I think there's a lot of you know to go back to the success factors um, uh, scenario I think there's a lot of customers that would if they had the choice they would have success factors on prep if they could oh yeah I think that's true um, yeah I mean Jared I think your your question I obviously I can't really speak for 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 SAP completely on this and some of it is is a bit of a moving target um, but in in general, the they're, they're, they have been able to maintain one S4 HANA code line, which is I think a positive for them. Um, but essentially, what they do when they when they put it on the public cloud is there there's some additional sort of cloudy characteristics <laughs> that are that are added to that that are associated with public cloud environments. But the code line remains the same. But the thing is that that essentially you're you're rewriting SAP, essentially you're rewriting SAP at that point in a HANA optimized manner and that just takes time. And so what, what they've been able to do historically is mo move the business suite on HANA, but they didn't really redo everything, right? They got it to work on HANA, but they didn't necessarily rewrite everything. And then they started adding new components to it, like sim simple finance. And so those new components, when they're added, they're generally available also on the cloud. Um, but that doesn't make for necessarily a complete suite of offerings. And so I think that's sort of what's going on there. 
Okay. So as new functionality is added, it is added to the cloud at the same time, from what I understand. And then, and then of course, they are going to add some specific things that are cloud only over time as well, uh, which I think they're doing a little bit now. But they'll they'll do more of that. So, so essentially, it just takes time for them to to add that rewritten functionality. Um, and so, what the private cloud environment enables them to do is to offer the the complete suite, but also the new components that are available. Whereas on the public cloud, they they can't offer the complete suite because that's not written for the cloud, <laughs> not not for the public cloud. Hopefully, right. that's not too confusing. <laughs> no, I mean, but one so. of the big one of the big things I see is like for many years in the SAP HCM world, the issue wasn't that. SAP wasn't coming out with new functionality. It was the fact that customers were not adopting that new functionality. Sure. Um, and one of the things I see with success factors is they, they're releasing a lot of functionality, but just with the public cloud nature and, and the way that stuff's delivered, it's still, you know, maybe 75% is opt-in, 25% is, opt uh, uh, is automatic. I'm seeing more customers uh, taking that new functionality. And I guess to me is in the s hana world, I, I don't know as much about the architecture, but if it's in the private cloud, is there more of a issue where customers don't take all this new functionality and all of a sudden they've got this new shiny software that's not getting all these new bells and whistles. And it's nothing, it's not, it's not SAP's fault. It's just if you deliver it in that manner, uh, you know, customers have a lot more maybe options and controls and, and ultimately down the road, I just don't think that's necessarily a good thing for customers and it's not necessarily a good thing for SAP. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we could probably talk about this for a whole <coughs> hour, so I'll probably shift the words in a sec. I, I think that um, this is something that we're going to hear a lot about in the tech ed season in the fall as far as various cloud configurations and cloud migrations and SAP promised a lot more information on integration roadmaps and things like that. So I think I think we will understand that better. But I totally hear your point around, you know, how customers are going to respond to this. And, you know, I think SAP is playing a tricky game that a lot of vendors are playing right now in terms of you don't want to rush your customers, but at the same time you want to provide the innovation path forward. And I think to a large extent SAP customers were – they were more positive about SAP's innovation roadmap, frankly, than I was expecting to hear. But but where the criticisms come in is things around integration, uh, migration, business case roadmap stuff. Those are the areas where I, I heard criticisms. Yeah, I mean, uh, two things sort of jump out. Is one is like I think this is one area where the HR domain is is ahead of the game as far as a lot of these things we're talking about. Maybe the S for Hana. These were issues that were more front and center probably two, three years ago in the HR world. So, to, to you know, that that's a good thing. And I think SAP, you know, has some experience now in, in that side of things, which I think is real positive. And the other one is, you know, kudos to SAP for getting high profile customers on stage two years in a, in a row. My favorite part of last year's show was when the CIO of Walmart came up and just with how she communicated that things aren't easy. It's a journey. You have to work with SAP. It's hard. Integration is hard. Some of these cloud decisions are hard. This year they had the Nestle CIO and I just thought it it struck a perfect balance of what I see on the ground is that customers that are making the journey with SAP and making huge business transformation and doing you know the buzzword of the day, digital transformation, that's hard work, and, and that takes a lot of time and effort, and a lot of smart people have to be involved, and, and it's not perfect, and you've got to make a decision that you're going down, you're taking a journey with a vendor, and you have to trust, and that's one of the reasons I think that the empathy theme, theme came out this year is that you have to trust that SAP is going to fill the gaps uh, and, and do the things around to help support you, and, and I think that both of those CIOs struck a great tone, and I think that I'd like to see more of that at future events because at the end of the day, that's what helps helps SAP be more empathetic, be more human, and I think ultimately help them sell more software. So just to wrap up this part of our discussion, I want to ask, starting with Luke and then Jarrett, uh, what are you hearing from, from your customers and clients in terms of how HCM fix, fits into the picture of, of the future that SAP is describing. Are they pretty clear in terms of that success factors is sort of your go-to release that will work alongside and with S4 HANA? 
you know, obviously, obviously SAP understands that not every customer is going to want to go that route and they might not want success factors. They might want another cloud HCM solution. But do you think customers are pretty clear on that now or are there still questions that you're hearing about the HCM part of the future? I don't know if it's that clear. I think for the cloud, it's, it's, it's clear for S4 HANA. Success factors is your HR. But I think it starts to get murky when you start looking at some of the other deployment options. You know, we have civil deployment options for S4 HANA, and I think, you know, it can be SAP on premise, but it has uh, to HR on premise, so it can be success factors. And, and, and I just think it's, even for me, I find it a little bit unclear about what fits into where. And I think if somebody like myself who, who is more involved in this, doesn't quite understand that. I'm wondering how many customers are actually understanding it. Yeah. No, I think I mean I think Luke brings up a good point. Actually, I have a customer right now that's moving to S4 HANA, and they're keeping their SAP on-premise uh, system in place, and they have some cloud offerings as well. So it's a, it was a strategic decision for them to move to S4 HANA for finance and some other areas of their business, keep their SAP HCM on-premise at this point. And, and have a few a few items in the cloud, and, and they're an educated customer. And so, you know, at the end of the day, to me, if you go to S4 HANA for finance, that your deployment options, my understanding, are still wide open as far as do you keep SAP HCM or do you go to success factors? Both of them are, to me, sort of like products that sit to the side that both will be integrated into various degrees into S4 HANA. So... But what we do know, correct, is that SAP is not going to uh, try to run any type of HR in S4 HANA aside from success factors going forward, right? In the sense that success factors is SAP's go forward HR in the long run. Right. I mean, at one point we could wake up and they could call success factors S4 HANA HR, but it ultimately will be, it ultimately is success factors. Yeah. So we know the big picture is is a little is is fairly clear compared to what it used to be, but but then as you as you guys both point out, that doesn't mean that all that all the deployment options today make make perfect sense. Sounds like there's uh, going to be a lot of questions because when you offer that kind of flexibility, that also creates questions in terms of what the best option is. Yeah, and especially John, when you also when you look at if you have public cloud true multi-tenant success factors feeding private S4 HANA, does, what type of implications does that have? You know, to me, the right. a perfect integration is going to be public cloud HR to public cloud finance. And, and to me, you know, and there's not as many hooks as people would, would, you know, seem to believe between the other modules and HR, but there is between HR and finance and some other areas. So maybe it's, maybe it's not as, as tightly integrated as some other areas need to be for your business, but it's still pretty important that, that HR and finance talk to each other. And it'll just be interesting to see how that evolves over time. Well, and one thing I thought was super interesting, and I don't know if you guys picked up on this as much, but for Sapphire is typically a business conference, and yet a lot of the themes were pretty technical. Uh, it started in the first keynote when uh, McDermott relayed that a lot of CIOs had expressed questions around integration. And that continued uh, into the following keynotes around promising integration roadmaps. And then we saw a big demo from Hasso on migration. Uh, so it was just kind of interesting. And, and I think SAP's made a lot of promises now uh, of detailed integration roadmaps. So I guess we'll hold them to it and see what they come up with for the fall. Yeah, I mean, one thing I found interesting, and, and VJ uh, summed it up pretty well in one of his blogs, is he was surprised that SAP was surprised by this CIO meeting because these are all things that, that yeah. CIOs have been saying for, for uh, years. It just must have finally had the right group of people in the right room at the right point in time. And I mean, I read some things, I don't know if they're true or not, but that the whole Bill McDermott speech and the whole tone of that was changed three weeks before Sapphire, which can make for some interesting behind the scenes to see uh, some planning that got thrown out. But, but you know, some of these concerns have been there for a while. I mean, I guess we can say, good thing the light bulb finally went off and, and, and an SAP is taking some of these things seriously. And it really appeared that they are at the highest levels. These are some strategic initiatives going forward. But 
Um, again, I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall at that CIO meeting in San Francisco. And Luke is in San Francisco a lot, so he might, for all I know, he might have even been, been a fly on that wall. Come on, Luke. Sam, <laughs> were you there? I, no, but I would have loved to have been. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it sounds like an entire keynote got scrapped based on CIO feedback, and as you're saying, as you're say, saying, Jared, it's not like that stuff hasn't been on the table for a long time. But hey, if you have a listening moment, you you got to run with it, and right. maybe maybe that will continue to be the case. There is one other little piece of the puzzle, which is just a personal axe that I'm grinding, if you don't mind indulging me, which is the Hana Cloud platform piece. So. At Sapphire, I talked to a couple SAP partners and my smaller partners. And my, my big disappointment at the moment is that, and I relay this to SAP leadership after the conference, but that the smaller partners are having a lot of trouble with go-to-market with, with the HANA Cloud platform. Um, and it has to do with the logistics of how you sell uh, apps at this point in time because you, you still, for the most part, can't sell apps like this off of an app store. And so you but they can be very powerful if sold properly in the context of, you know, perhaps selling success factors as a whole or a follow-up to a success factor sale. And I would love to see an ecosystem thrive around the HANA Cloud platform. And unfortunately right now, there's a lot of go-to-market barriers. I won't list them all, but it has to do with things like um, if, if I'm not an approved vendor at a customer, how do I get my app uh, to be sold? And, you know, why can't SAP account executives sell the app themselves and pass something along to me. There's just a whole bunch of questions there that need to get sorted. Otherwise, what we're going to be left with is the thing that I don't want, which is a handful of big partners doing all the app development for HANA Cloud Platform, and you miss out on all the cool shops and all the little industry groups and the hardcore people that want to build apps. So right now I'm a little frustrated with that. It's For me, it's a, it's a big piece that I think isn't going to help very much from from the extensibility part of, of things like success factors. Um, I think if if developers, whether that's the big partners or that's the small niche partners or anything in between, if they can't get in front of customers to sell their products, then what's the point of them developing? And if they're not going to be developing, then customers are not going to be able to understand what this HANA Cloud platform is about. You know, it might be very obvious for the Internet of Things, for example, what HANA Cloud Platform is and what the value proposition is of the platform. But you know, to go back again to, to, to the HR example, to your average HR person, HANA Cloud Platform doesn't mean anything to them. A platform doesn't mean anything. What means things to them are um, solutions for their problems. And if, right. and if developers don't have a way of being able to get their solutions in front of customers, then what's the point? Why, why, why bother? And we hear a lot of noises about SAP wanting to help partners build and, 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 and deliver and whatnot. But from, from what I've been hearing, and I, I, I think I heard some of the same conversations as you, John, is that sales executives, uh, AEs and whatnot, are not able to actually put solutions in front of customers. Or Well, not that they can't. They won't. I mean, if they don't get comped on it, they're not going to do that. And the problem right now is there's no way of them being comped. There's no way of having the equivalent of a solution extension, you know, like a benefit focus or workforce software type of deal for these app developers. So it really blocks their go-to market, which blocks their ability to, to have a sustainable business model, which is going to enable them to create the apps, which is then going to sell the platform. So it's kind of like uh, as if be creating a blocker for themselves in terms of adoption in one of the areas that they've been trying to push on a cloud platform in for, you know, two to three years. Yeah, and from my standpoint, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the if you enable it just for the larger players, you get the same old recycled ideas. And at right. the end of the day, SAP, this is a real competitive advantage. This is something that, at least in the HR world, that other vendors don't have. This gives them the ability to fill gaps in their software. And if consulting firms, just the big consulting firms, are using it as a tool to get their foot in the door with a couple products, that doesn't help the customers. And, and, and you know, when you look at the Apple announcements and other stuff, they, they're looking to come up with ways to get, up, get your non-enterprise software developer into enterprise software. 
And at the end of the day, you have to make it easy for them to, you know, to see some dollars at the end of that rainbow. And, and you know, the ideas that are really going to change the, the, to me, the landscape are ideas that are coming from outside of the industry because the people are thinking of things with a new perspective. And you see that so much with, you know, the, the Android store and the Apple store is that some of these things that people are using this technology for are things that you, you would never thought of. And they're things that, that people like and use. So they have to figure this out um, and, and make it easier to get in front of customers. And maybe something with what Jonathan Becker is doing and, and, the, and that the whole digital store. I mean, that, that seems like a nice logical area for people to potentially, you know, find some apps like this. But, and they've had some success factors apps on there, some products, but they, but they pulled them off. And so I, I don't know the answer, but it, it feels like it's something that needs to be solved. Yeah, and I think even if customers find the app on the store, they might want to have a direct dealing with that vendor and ask questions and then so you hear an anecdote like I heard at Sapphire of like, well, the customer wants the app, but there's no way to procure it. The 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 app builder's not a preferred vendor. So instead of jumping through those hoops, they go through an intermediary. This is gonna sound really familiar to you consultant guys. <laughs> the the intermediary takes their markup, uh, an, an, a, you know, an, a big markup. Uh, for doing nothing but passing the app through, which reduces the value to the customer and destroys the whole value proposition. And there you have it. And so SAP's got to solve these problems or they're going to lose, I think, the chance to capitalize on one of their potential areas of, of advantage, not just in HR, but this carries over into pretty much every area. So this is something on my mind that SAP's got to fix, I think, for the tech head season. So we'll see what they do. Right, and we have, I mean, in the in the success factors world, you know, Enterprise Jungle is is they, they might be the most well known HCP app vendor, period. And they, and I think you've I think you've talked to him before, John, but he's went out and done a lot of uh, guerrilla marketing. I mean, he's been him and his him and his group have been, you know, they've been everywhere to try to promote the the HCP apps. I think they've been on some stage at some major events, and and you need more guys like James and 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 and, and his company out there. You need 50 of those and 100 of those, and that's where you're yeah. going to start to see some real difference. Well, right, and if you talk with James, and he'll be glad to talk with you about this, he'll tell you that he's having challenges with the go-to-market piece, and so right. if someone like James of Enterprise Jungle can't get this right after all the work he's put in, then, right. then what does that tell you about everyone else's chances? So anyway, that's something for SAP to work on. Uh, thanks, guys, for that. Uh, I'm going to wrap this discussion here. Uh, but it was really interesting. I appreciate your time on that. So five, four, three, two, one, break. Hi, this is John Reed. You just listened to the end of the uh, S4 HANA podcast that I did with Jarrett and Luke a little while ago. Uh, it's actually part one, and then in part two, we get into an HCM cloud uh, field lessons consulting skills session, uh, which is already available on video and also in audio format. Uh, this is a little bit of an unusual postscript to the podcast. Uh, Jared and Luke asked me some challenging questions about S4 HANA and the relevance of the public cloud and customers moving to the public cloud. And we even had, I guess you could say, a little bit of a debate around whether a private cloud uh, migration would actually be viable as a step towards the public cloud. Uh, and so as a result of that, I wanted to get some additional perspectives from a very informed individual, which is uh, Dick Hirsch. So I had him listen to the podcast and provide me with some feedback. Uh, the other thing I want to note is that the comments that I made around go to market for the HANA Cloud platform are essentially slightly modified now that I've heard some views from SAP inside of SAP recently that make me think there's a little more awareness and progress on these issues than I thought when I delivered my uh, rant on the podcast. So while I think there's still a lot of work to be done, I do want to acknowledge that I heard from SAP some stuff that made me think that they are trying to make this easier for smaller shops to get their HANA Cloud platform apps to market. So I guess we'll need to revisit that in the tech ed time frame. But I do want to acknowledge SAP has been pushing this a little bit. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to also say, which is sort of 
less good news is that in the process, I also discovered that the developer license part is not as smooth as it really should be on the Honda Cloud platform side yet. There is, there is still not an individual developer's license of the, of the kind of free perpetual type that aspiring developers really want. There is a trial, but the trial license isn't what you would want for actually building products. Now, what SAP would say is, well, why not join the Partner Edge program? But Partner Edge costs have gone up in recent years, and most of the individual developers I pulled so far told me that they felt that was a little bit out of reach to them. To be clear, I like the SAP Partner Edge program quite a bit, uh, but I don't think it takes the place also of an individual developer's license in this context. So just to share with you this little correspondence I have with Dick Hirsch, I asked him to listen to the podcast with this section around the S4 HANA public cloud in mind. And here's what Dick had to say. Just listen to the podcast. Jared and Luke are correct in their assessment regarding the difficulties of moving to the public cloud, especially regarding the challenges of lifting and shifting, as Luke mentions. I think that there is still one code base, which is the foundation for all the different flavors of S4. The difference between the different flavors is associated with functionality, flexibility, that is permitted within that single code base. The cloud flavor of S4 is limited the most while on-prem has fewer limitations. The reason why there are different release cycles isn't due to the different code lines, but rather the speed at which customers want to deal with these changes in the code line. The comment from Jarrett that I thought was especially interesting regarded the fact that the same path arguments that are confronting S4's move to the cloud were made in the past few years regarding the transition of HCM to the cloud. SAP would be wise to revisit customers' reactions to this journey to assist in the S4 public cloud story. This is why the placement of go-to-market for S4 public cloud and the success factors organization is important, but I have yet to see it bear any fruits in my humble opinion. So I wrote Dick back and I said, uh, quoted him and I around the cloud flavor of S4 is limited the most while on-prem has the fewest limitations. I asked him, do you think this is because of the public cloud has more rigid aspects such as multi-tenancy? And Dick responded and said, multi-tenancy is one reason, but standardization of the solution is probably the biggest reason. If you have to support many different customer organizations, you have greater test efforts, higher support costs, et cetera. The biggest challenge of the public cloud is providing flexibility via configuration rather than customization. To achieve this goal, you have to convince customers that their particular customization should be replaced by standard solutions that are adoptable via configuration, not always an easy task. So I sent Dick one more email around this because this gets to that question of whether the private cloud would be a a stepping stone for customers into the public cloud, which was the argument I made that, anyway, uh, I said, so you, like Jarrett, reject the idea that a private cloud version could help with the standardization process by providing a potential step into the public cloud without going all the way into the pain of that transition in one, in one move. And Dick said, I don't reject the idea of the private cloud version, not the one based on HCC, but the other one. I think it is useful for customers if they want to move towards a public cloud. The question is whether SAP can provide enough incentives for them to want to move to make the final step. If a customer can retain their own customizations and the associated costs aren't high, then the incentive to move is lower. The public cloud must then have lower costs, either via subscription fees or other elements, as well as provide innovation at a faster pace than other S4 versions. The problem is the positioning of S4 as the core of the digital transformation story. If customers accept that message, then they might be willing to jump to the public cloud version to get access to innovation earlier than their competitors. Those entities providing or hosting such private cloud as for solutions. Uh, and Dick uh, says he's not clear at this time whether it's only SAP or other SIs as well. And, of course, that could change also. Uh, he says they may not want to lose customer to the less lucrative public cloud. So those are some interesting issues. And if you caught that comment about the HANA Enterprise Cloud Dick made, uh, SAP is also made that distinction, which I mentioned during the podcast, which is uh, SAP is no longer really even positioning HEC, the HANA Enterprise Cloud, as a cloud per se. 
uh, in terms of a private version. So the HCC would be essentially, if you want a hosted version of S4 HANA and the business suite or whatever it is you want, and basically all you want to do is move your IT stuff off-site uh, so you can have, keep all your customizations and everything. But that's not really part of the forward S4 HANA product roadmap per se. Uh, that's just another hosting option. So that's the distinction there. Anyhow, that was probably a little bit wonky for some of you. But the point behind all this is that there's some very interesting debates and questions around the path to the public cloud for S4 HANA, how many customers are going to want to go on that path, and whether, for example, that private cloud option that I was discussing is actually a viable uh, interim step to, to begin the process of standardization heading towards a public cloud version as that functionality matures. Uh, we're just going to have to watch this debate and see what customers have to say. I think, I think we sort of framed some of the dilemmas. We probably didn't provide all the answers, but that's the nature of the beast, right? Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and, and if you're interested in HCM stuff, make sure to check out Part 2 on the field lessons from Success Factors Consulting Projects. We also get into certification on that, so I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Bye.